Today, I'll be giving you an introduction into Unity's input system for touch. And this works exactly as you see here on mobile as well. And so what you see here is that we are simulating touch in the Unity editor. And then once we're ready to build, we can directly build to our phone and it will now work with our finger instead of a mouse. And thank you to Unity for sponsoring this video. And so for this, we'll be using the new, but not so new input system. And to do so, we can go into the window package manager. Then we can go to Unity registry at the top and we have to download the input system package, which you can scroll down until you locate input system, which currently it's at 1.3.0 at the time of this video and click install. Or you can use the search bar up here to search input system, which filters out the packages and make sure here to click yes to restart the editor. And this will make the input system apply the new changes. And so why do you even want to use the new input system? Well, I do have a whole video just on that topic but there's two main reasons that I use it. One of them is because it encourages cross-platform compatibility of controls. So you can define an action and it can now work on two different devices. Let's say your phone and the computer and maybe even the PlayStation 5. So you don't have to write code for each one of these consoles. You just have to write the code one time. And the second one is because it is event driven, meaning that it shoots off events in response to certain actions that have been performed. And so now you don't need to do everything in the update method anymore, which is really neat because I hated having the update method be cluttered with tons of if else statements. So I'll show you how to do that now. To start, let's make a scripts folder. So right click and create a folder and I'm just going to name it underscore scripts so it can be the first folder and you'll want to right click and create an input action which is the last option input actions and so this is going to be basically your directory of actions and so I'm going to call this touch action and a action is just a certain control so let's say you want the player to jump that will be one action running will be another action and within that action you'll have controls that trigger that action so the first thing we need is an action map so let's create an action map and this is just a set of actions so let's just call this touch and it's neat because you can actually disable and enable different maps for different circumstances so you might want a set of controls on one scene but not on another scene and so here are the actions and each action will have a control that it is bound to so let's say we want our player to move to a certain location well you can select this action and press f2 and rename this to move or add one here instead and name that move, which I'm just going to right click and delete this one. So now you have a move action, which will be able to query in our code and see whenever the player has pressed the control that is bound to our move action. So for an action, we have a type and it can have multiple types. You have value button or pass through button is simply if it is well a button and you press it once and it returns one value similar to a key on the keyboard, the mouse button, even pressing down on the screen can be considered a button. Then we have value, which allows you to select a control type and the control type is what this action will return. So right now we have it selected as a button, so it will return a type of float. Axis will also return a type of float. However, axis is on a scale. Button will only return zero, one, or negative one. Well, this will return a float value depending on the control that you're using. We can also return a vector two for something such as a joystick or even the WASD keys or you can just keep it general and select any and have the control itself derive what type it will return. So as an example, if we select here, no binding, the binding is the actual control itself. We can select the path, which you'll see there's numerous options here, but we'll want to go to the touch screen option and you'll see now here are all of the different controls that we can assign to our action. We can assign the delta, which you see has an X and a Y. So the delta returns a vector two. We can assign the position press. So this is a Boolean and tells you if a button has been pressed, you can return the pressure of the press. And now there's something called primary touch. The primary touch is the 
finger that's driving this current action. So if you only have one finger on the screen, that will be the primary touch. And if you scroll down, you can actually see now you have touch zero, touch one, touch two, touch three, all the way to touch nine. So it supports up to 10 fingers on the screen, which makes sense. And so you can have actions for all sorts of fingers. In our case, we only want to do one finger and we'll see that for each finger, you can get the Delta indirect touch, which means if this was either a finger or some sort of pen that touched the device, the phase that the touch is on. So touches have phases, whether it's started, whether it's moved and whether it has been finished, the current position, and this is returned in screen coordinates, whether the touch has contact with the screen, the pressure, the radius of the touch, the start position. So when you started pressing on the screen, not where you currently are, but when you started pressing on it, when you started pressing on the screen, if you've tapped on the screen, how many times you've tapped on it and the actual ID of this touch. So every touch has an ID associated with it. So you can keep track of the fingers and whatnot. And so you can look at these more in depth in the documentation which I will link down below. You'll see here all of the controls, the types and the descriptions of these controls. But for now, what we want to keep track of is the position of our touch. So in this case, let's go back to the action and select our control type to vector two. And if you're wondering the difference between the value and the pass through, there's not much difference up front. And I have a whole video explaining this, but basically pass through does not perform any processing on the input. So if you have multiple fingers on the screen, it will send all of that input into your action. Whereas value, you have a driving finger or a driving control that determines the output of an action. So in this case, with our move, we only really want one finger to drive the move action. So once we've selected that and with vector two, we can go to no binding and now go to touch screen and actually select right here position and two other quick things. We have interactions, which basically determine when an action is being performed. So if you want this action to be performed, once you've held down a certain amount of time, you can put hold, you can do a press, which is just pressing down a slow tap. So tapping is just quickly tapping on the screen and then there's also tap and then processors add some processing to the value that's outputted from this action. And I have like a million videos on all of this explaining really in depth what each of these mean, which are in the description. And I'm just going to rename this with F2 to touch position. And another action that I want to have is touch press. So once we press on the screen, the path will be here. Touch screen press single touch. We don't want multi touch here. We only want this to be triggered once we press with one finger. And you can also search up here for an action. Or if you have the control, you can press listen. And if I press the space bar, for example, the space will show up here. You can also add multiple bindings, which are the controls themselves to an action. And you can also add modifiers, which I do have another video on. OK, so now we have our two main actions. And I just want to make note that as a control type, you can also return a whole touch control type, which is very interesting. That lets you see all of the details related to a specific finger. But I will put that back to vector two. So once you're done, make sure to save the asset. You can also click auto save here so it saves it automatically and we can exit out of that. Now to actually use this in our script, we're going to want to right click on the hierarchy and create an empty game object. And let's call this the touch manager. And now in the inspector, we can add a player input component, which is included in the input system package. And now we can just drag and drop our input action asset into the actions parameter here, or you can select this little circle and search for it. The player input component is basically a wrapper around the input system that gives you a set of helper functions and just makes it easier to use the input system without having to write so much code up front. And you'll see here we have a default map. So the map that's default and we only have one. So it's touch. There's different ways how to use the player input component. I do have another whole video on this. I know I am repeating that quite a bit, but if you do want to learn more in depth, I do recommend looking at that specific video, which is how to use Unity's input system. And these are different ways on how to read the events being triggered from the input action asset. In this case, I recommend creating a script and doing it yourself just because it gives you more control. So let's call this the touch manager script. 
And so the first thing we want to do is erase all the nonsense that we don't need. And then we want to import the using unity engine dot input system. And now we want a reference to our player input component. So we want a private player input. Let's call it player input. Then in an awake function, we can get a reference to that. So player input equals get component player input. Right. And now basically we want to get a reference to our actions in the player input. Now you can do that each time. However, I like to make variables for them. So private input action, and we can call this the touch position action. And we also have a private input action and we can call this the touch press action. And so then in the awake function, we can do touch press action equals player input dot actions, which is our list of actions. And you'll see that now we can have some parameters here, such as action maps, which return the maps associated with the action. You can add an action map. We can use find action if you'd like. We can find our action, whatever you named it, and it is cap sensitive. So make sure you spell it exactly correct. So we called it touch press, touch press. Adversely, you can also do this if you like to go more wild and old school, which is how I like to do it. And then we can copy that and now do that for the touch position action and now do touch position. And so now we have a reference to our actions. If we want to be notified on when these actions have been pressed, either we can in the update function check on each frame if a value is being pressed and read the value, or we can use events. And I'll show you how to do both of them. In the case of events, we can have an on enable function and an on disable function because we want to make sure to unsubscribe from events when the script is being disabled so we don't keep getting notified of things when we can't do anything about it. And so let's say for our touch press action we want to be notified once it's performed so there's three callbacks there's the started callback which is when the action has been started there's the performed callback when the action has been officially performed in the case of a button that just means it's been pressed down and so the started and performed callback will be called at the same time. However, if you have an interaction on this action, the performed callback may be called at a later time. There is also the canceled callback. So whenever the action has been finished or canceled, AKA I lift my finger up from the button that will be called. So we can do performed and then subscribe to this event, which is plus equals. So basically we wanna listen to this event. We have our ears open and whenever our ears have picked up a sound from this event, we want to call a function called touch press, which we don't have defined. So we can do private void touch pressed and you'll see it's not working because we need to take a type of input action dot callback context context. And this is just information regarding our action that has been performed. And we can actually query this to read the value and find out more info. And we can just copy this and put it on disable and replace the plus with a minus. So that means we want to unsubscribe from this event and stop listening with our ears or Unity's ears or the script's ear. I don't really know where I'm going with the ears part. All right. And so now this function will be called when the action is performed. And so you can use this touch press action directly. So we can do context and get more information regarding the action. In this case, usually what you'd want to do is read the value of this action. So there's several functions for that. You can do read value, which is what I usually do. So for example, you can read the value and pass in the type. So I know it will return a type of float. And so now I can equal that to a type of float value and we can read debug.log this value. However, if you don't know the type up front, they've actually added since my previous video, read value as button, which will return a Boolean basically telling you if this value is pressed. And then we can do read value as object, which doesn't require you having to know the type at runtime. However, it does allocate heap memory. So I just recommend passing in the type directly if you know up front what the type is. So let's test this out in the editor. But before we actually test this, we need to enable touch simulation in the editor to simulate touch. So you can do that by going to window analysis, input debugger, and then under options, select simulate touch input from mouse or pen. And you'll see that now we have a simulated touch screen under the devices. 
And you can actually double click that and see all of the values that are being performed at each frame. So you'll see that my position is moving because my mouse is moving. And I do have a video on the input debugger as well. Wow. And so before we press play, let's also add in the script we just made, which is called touch manager. We can just add that to the touch manager game object. So it reads the player input component attached to it. And you'll see that once I press on the screen, one is being printed out, which means that it's correctly getting my touch. Alrighty, that's great and all, but let's actually have some functionality here so that once we press on the screen, our character will move to the location. Now, you don't necessarily have to use the touch pressed at the start. You can just do this touch press position action dot performed plus equals and your function. However, I found this works best if you first see if the screen has been pressed before querying the position. So in that case here where we press on the screen, we can now do touch position action dot read value and we can read it, which is a vector two. We can do vector two position. And so this does return a screen position value. Basically it's something like this where the zero zero is the top left and the bottom right is the width and the height of the pixel similar to 1920 by 1080 but that doesn't correspond to the world position so we want to convert wherever we're tapping from screen to world coordinates very simple with that we can do camera main so get our main camera and you might want to store this object camera.main if you use it frequently and then we can use the function screen to world point and we can pass in this screen position that we've read which i will just delete this line actually and now we can just equal that to vector three position. And this might actually make the Z kind of funky. So I like to set the Z position to what it was before, which in this case, we don't have a reference to our player. So if we scroll up, we can just get a serialized field private game object player. Or we can just get the transform of the player as well. And we can do player.transform.position.z to make sure the Z value, the depth, isn't changing of the player then we can just set the player dot transform dot position equals to the new position awesome and so for the main character i got it from this free asset pack on itch.io link in description pretty cool go support them for now i'll just right click and create a 2d object sprite circle and this will be our player then in the touch manager, we can drag in the circle as our player and we can press play. And so once we press, you'll see that now the circle will go towards our mouse. Awesome. For a quick overview on how to use these values on the update method. Well, it's very simple. Let's say, for example, with the position, you can do touch position action dot. And similar as before, you can read the value on every frame and it will return a vector two in this case. Or if you want to tell if this action has been pressed on the frame, you can do what was press this frame there's also was released this frame so this is similar to the canceled callback and was performed this frame so if the performed callback was called on this frame then this function will be called so if you wanted to you can do like if the touch press action was performed this frame then we can now do the same thing that we did here and just copy it there very simple however i like this way better because it's much neater and now there's not this in the update method which this update function will be called on every frame and so if you want to build this to android you'll have to have the Android packages installed. So in the Unity Hub, you can go to installs, find your version, or here, for example, you can go to the selection that you want and put install with Unity Hub and it will open. Then back in Unity Hub, you can select the gear icon next to the version, add modules and select the versions you want to install. In this case, I already have Android installed. You just install that pretty easy. Or if you want iOS, you select iOS, click continue and go with downloading that. And then you'd want to click on your platform and click switch platform and i do have a video on how to build to android on how to make your phone setup work with this because it's quite an involved process and a little out of scope for this video and so once you have switched the platform make sure to select development build so you can actually build this without using keys which the keys are used for app stores so that they can verify that the application is yours and that it's not stolen. And then once your phone is connected, you can select build and run. I usually create a new directory here called 
builds and then I just save the build there. Then I just call it something and save the build. And now it'll start to build it to your phone and make sure that your scene is added in the scenes in build up here. And for some reason, if it doesn't work out right, I had to go to run device and select my actual device and then click patch and run. Don't ask me why. And so now you should see something like this where you can tap the screen and the circle will move around. Now, two quick things I want to mention. First of all, if you want the game to mimic the phone resolution, you could go up here to free aspect and select a 16 by 9 portrait aspect. And now it will mimic a phone resolution. You can make sure everything is aligned perfectly. And secondly, there is another way to control touch called the enhanced touch. So you see there's the touch screen, which is what we're using. And then there's the enhanced touch, which provides enhanced touch support. And basically with the enhanced touch, you can get information by finger and by touch. So if you want more in-depth information on your touches, the enhanced touch might be a way to go. For a quick introduction on how to enable it, first we need to import the Unity Engine Input System Enhanced Touch. And I like to equal it to using Enhanced Touch because if you have the Input System package, it has trouble differentiating some of the objects on the Enhanced Touch to the Input System and you have to write out this each time. So if you do it like this, it's much easier. For example, we can just do enhance touch dot and then call one of its functions or objects. So when the script has been enabled, we need to enable the touch simulation. So we can use this on the editor and we also have to enable enhance touch support. On disable, we disable the touch simulation and the enhance touch support. And then it's quite simple. It's the same concept. You can do enhance touch dot touch dot and you can do on finger down and and you can have a function which takes in a type of finger here. And with that finger, now you have access to more information here. So the index, last touch, the screen, and the screen position, and the touch history. So you'll see that there are some extra options here. So we have current touch. And then with the current touch, now we have even more information here. So we have the delta, whether it's in progress, whether it's a tap, the phase that it's on. So there's different phases similar to the other input system touch class. Green position, start time, tap count, if it's valid or not, if it's ended. And so with this, you can do a lot of processing with the fingers and the touches. I'm not going to go in depth on this right now, but the documentation is down below. And all you need to know is that we have these things that we can subscribe to. You can get the active fingers, the fingers, the events. And if you want to use this in the update method, you can in a similar way. You have access to the fingers being pressed. You can do something like for each. We can do enhanced touch dot touch you can do touch in the enhanced touch dot touch dot active touches now with each touch you'll have access to all of these data points and you can do touch dot phase for example and you can do some sort of comparison so if the phase is equal to the enhanced touch dot touch phase is equal to the touch phase dot began canceled move or stationary then perhaps you can do something whatever your heart and your game desires and so you'll see here we actually have to use the input system dot touch phase dot began because unity engine has something called touch phase which is quite confusing but that's okay so i hope this video helped you out and if it did please like and subscribe and comment down below and thank you to unity for sponsoring this video i'd also like to thank my patrons for their support they make these kind of videos possible if you're interested the link is in the description i offer source code early access and exclusive content and if you haven't already make sure to join our discord where you can chat post memes or or ask for help. I'll see you next time.